All right. Well, thank you, Dennis, um, and good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who have not had a chance to introduce myself to, my name is Susan Pasco, and I am at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service based out in Falls Church, Virginia. And I do have the honor of serving as the executive secretary to the Aquatic News and Species Task Force. Uh, so what I've been asked to do today is just give an update on what the task force is up to. Um, but what I wanted to start with is uh, just an overview of the task force. Every time I do do these types of meetings and updates, I always meet new people and realizing that um, a lot of times people are a little unsure what the National Task Force is, who our membership are, and how we do relate to the Western Regional Panel. Um, so I'm going to start with just a bit of a uh, Task Force 101. So if you've been around a while, you know all this, feel free to zone out, close your eyes for the next couple of slides. Um, but we were established by uh, legislation. Uh, we were established with the Non-Indigenous Aquatic Nuisance Prevention and Control Act in 1990, reauthorized in 1996. And within the act, it gave us a mission to develop and implement a program for waters of the United States to prevent the introduction and dispersal of aquatic nuisance species, to monitor, control, and study such species, and to disseminate related information. So no small task, right? Um, so as you can imagine, to assist with this mission, we do have a fairly large membership. Within that statute, it mandated seven federal agencies and four ex officio members. Uh, we have since grown to 13 federal members and 13 ex officio members. Our act also specifies we form two regional panels. Uh, we now have six regional panels. And in addition to help the task force operate, we do have five standing committees. And I always like to point out as well is we are the only federal mandated intergovernment agent organization solely dedicated to aquatic invasive species control and prevention. Uh, so here's basically a diagram of our membership and how we operate. Uh, so as I mentioned, we do have 13 federal members. We are co-chaired by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well as NOAA. Um, you also can see we have several others there, include BLM, uh, Reclamation, Army Corps, Coast Guard, basically any federal agency that does have a portion of their time dedicated to invasive species control. We want to make sure they are included on the task force. We also have a number of our ex officios members. Um, we do have some that represent regional interests, such as Great Lakes Commission, Lake Champlain. Um, we have industry represented, um, such as power, public power and waterworks. Um, we also have tribal interests, as well as research, such as Smithsonian. Um, again, I mean, we do have our six regional panels listed up there. I'll talk about them a bit more in a second. Um, we also do have our standing committees. Um, we do have five right now, which were recently formed to align with our new strategic plan. In addition to these standing committees, we also will form ad hoc committees. Uh, so these are basically committees we'll put together to focus on a very specific issue. Once their task is complete, they'll be disbanded. Uh, so in the past, we've had ad hoc committees focus on ballast water issues, economics. A lot of times, we'll have a committee come together to form like a species control plan. So once that plan is complete, they're disbanded. Okay. So although the National Task Force does have a national focus, we do recommend or recognize that there is a tremendous amount of activity that is occurs at the regional, state, and local levels. Um, and so for that reason, we did have uh, two regional panels that mandated in our act. Um, that was the Great Lakes as well as the Western Regional Panel. Um, however, since that time, we recognize additional regional panels are needed. So we now have the Mississippi River Basin Panel, the Gulf and South Atlantic the Mid-Atlantic, and the Northeast. Um, so again, these panels are essential to help the task force achieve that mission, but also they do a great job of helping unify local efforts to form that regional coordinated response. Okay. Our state management plans are another critical component of the task force. So part of the task force, we do provide states technical assistance um, and support to develop and implement their state management plans. In order to be eligible for funding from the Fish and Wildlife Service, these plans must be approved by the task force. Um, so as of right now, uh, the task force has approved 43 plans. 40 of those are focused on state efforts, and we do have three interstate plans as well. Uh, so Nevada was actually our most recent plan approved by the task force. We're hoping to add Colorado very soon, perhaps in May. Um, but since you can imagine, these plans were started to develop in 1990s. Some of them have quite aged as well. Uh, so we do encourage states now and then to revisit their plans, update it as needed, and if it does have a major revision to it, we do ask them to submit that plan back to the task force for reapproval. 
Okay, uh, moving on to our last meeting. Um, last meeting was held in May 5th or 6th um, in Lake South Tahoe. Uh, so I'd like to thank the Western Regional Panel for hosting our last meeting. Um, in particular, shout out to Dennis. Uh, Dennis was essential to help secure our venue um, and the field trip as well. So if you wanna make task force members very happy, put them on a boat, middle of Lake Tahoe, they're quite content for the rest of the meeting. So within our meeting, uh, we did have three votes. Um, the first one was to approve the revised Wisconsin management plan. As I mentioned, um, they do revise their plans from time and time again. Um, we also approve our, uh, sorry, our task force report to Congress for FY15, I'm sorry, FY16 as well as 17. Uh, so once the task force does approve a tort to report to Congress, uh, we do need to have it cleared by the leadership, both at the Fish and Wildlife Service as well as NOAA. And from there it goes to our Office of Management and Budget for their approval. Uh, so I'm very happy to report as of this week, we finally passed through those remaining hurdles. Uh, so we're hoping to have that report delivered to Congress by the end of the month, uh, just in time to start writing our 2018-2019 report. Um, and our last vote was to approve the strategic plan for 20 to 2025. Um, so that is really where the main focus of the rest of my update is going to be. Uh, but before I get there, just to go over some of our action items that were also came out of our last meeting. Um, the first one is ballast water. That continues to be a very large issue for the task force. Um, so we had a great update from Alan on the VETA legislation, um, and I'll talk on that a bit more in a second. Um, but we do have some roles that are specific to the task force um, that we are currently scoping to decide exactly what steps need to be taken to fulfill that mandate. Um, we also do receive recommendations from our regional panel, so we do have two uh, that did come about at our last meeting. Uh, the first one was from our Mid-Atlantic panel, asking for additional support for their Nutria eradication programs that develop in the Delvara Peninsula. Uh, so we continue to uh, promote that recommendation into the appropriate agencies um, and get them the necessary support they need to continue that program. Um, we also had the Western Regional panel who uh, we had a discussion about the Quagga Zebra Action Plan. Um, so we had an action item here for Elizabeth to come back to the Western Area panel and discuss kind of the perspectives um, where that plan should head next. Um, I know she's planning on talking about that or you'll have that discussion later, um, but she's also going to give the task force an update as well at our next meeting. So we're looking forward to hearing from that. Um, next action item here was uh, really focused on our strategic plan. Once we received that approval, it was really much, we have a plan, how are we gonna implement it? Uh, so because of that, we did form five new subcommittees. Uh, so the meeting really ended asking for volunteers for the subcommittees, which the co-chairs then reviewed and approved. Um, once those committees were finalized, their task was to meet uh, between the May and the November meeting uh, to start reviewing the strategic plan, looking at those priorities, looking at the outputs, and basically forming a work plan uh, that will develop over the next year. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and give you a brief overview of our strategic plan. Uh, so we do have six goals in our current strategic plan, uh, which is coordination, prevention, early detection, rapid response, control and restoration, research and education and outreach. Yeah, outreach and education. Um, so each one of those goals does step down into specific objectives, specific outputs, and it really does form the blueprint for what the task force hopes to accomplish within the next five years. So as I mentioned before, we now have five standing committees that are going to be implementing those goals. Um, they are developing their work plan that will be reviewed and discussed and finalized at our November meeting. Uh, but since this meeting was before that, I'm just gonna give you kind of a sneak preview on what those work plans will look like and the work they hope to accomplish over the next year. Uh, just keeping in mind, this has not yet been finalized or reviewed by the task force, so it can and will likely change. Okay. Um, but first, taking a look at coordination. Coordination is our one goal that does not have a standing committee. Um, it really just focuses focus on the day-to-day -day operations of the task force. Um, however, a couple of uh, high priority outputs that were identified that we want to accomplish the next year under coordination, um, foremost is to develop bylaws. Uh, task force has always had a charter. We have never actually had a bylaws for the task force. Um, and it has become very clear in the last few meetings that we really need a document that kind of spells out the roles and expectations 
expectations for our members, um, as well as for the regional panels and how they interact with the task force members as well. Uh, so we do hope to have a draft prepared for the November meeting, which will up for review and discussion uh, by the members and panels. Another output here is to establish a process for members to respond to recommendations brought forward by the regional panels. Um, I mentioned before that is one of the duties of the regional panels is to bring recommendations for task force consideration. Um, however, we were working on to refine a more formal process for how we receive recommendations, how they align with our new strategic plan, and also speaking with the uh, panels to make sure that we are appropriately responding um, in a way that is satisfactory to the panels. And the last one we have here is to uh, annually assess task force accomplishments and report on the progress. Uh, so every year we do ask our members and panels to give us an update as far as their actions that may contribute to the strategic plan. Uh, so we continue to review those accomplishments. We like to look at where we're really strong in making progress, but also really identifying those gaps as well. Um, so that is generated in a report both for task force members and also included in a report to Congress that will eventually go up to them as well. Okay, uh, moving on to the prevention goal. Um, and once again, these are just the high priority out, the outputs that are hoped to be accomplished this year. Um, there are many others, but since it is a five-year plan, we do have five years to accomplish all of them. Um, but some of the ones they are hoping to address this year um, for most is to evaluate and refine the pathway risk assessment process. Um, we do have a document out there. It is quite dated right now, so they would like to revisit that and update it, um, as well as complete guidelines for its use and interpretation of tools. Uh, so really that is a tool designated to look at your pathways, try to figure out which ones are your high priorities, try to identify where there are barriers to managing those pathways, and hopefully coming up with ways to mitigate that. Um, the next one here we have is to work with federal agencies to make importation data electronically available and searchable. Um, this has been an issue that has come up time and time again in front of the task force. Uh, we understand that ports and other areas of entry into the United States do need improvements as far as species identification, as well as how those species are recorded so they can have a better handle on what exactly is coming into the United States. Uh, so we continue to work with enforcement agencies and other federal agencies to try and improve that process. Next here is to assess new introductions to determine where prevention managers may have been lacking. Um, so through the USGS database, thank you Wes, um, we do get species alerts that we know there have been new introduction to the United States or perhaps into a new watershed. And what that signals to us is that somewhere along the lines our prevention measures have failed us. So it really is doing more of a deep dive into some of those high profile new occurrences to decide where that ball is dropped um, and how we can improve either that process or perhaps strengthen our authorities. Another one here is to enter into national prevention practices and agreements with responsible industry sectors. Um, so this is one thing the task force has recently been done, much to the leadership of the Western Regional Panel with the boating industry. Uh, many are familiar with the work that has been done and the technical information report that has been pr um, finalized. Um, so now we're looking into what other industries can we replicate that is, um, such as seaplanes or anglers, um, pet industries, nursery industry. So they're really starting to expand that effort. Okay. Um, and of course, I wanted to mention uh, the VD Act, because once again, ballast water does remain a very high topic. I'm not going to go into a lot of details. We got a lot of information on VITA yesterday um, as far as EPA and Coast Guard responsibilities, uh, but also pointing out that the task force does have a role as well. Uh, we were assigned to help the, Secre the Secretary of Homeland Security as well as the Minister of the EPA uh, to develop um, to help establish a framework for federal and intergovernment response to ANS risk from discharges from vessels subject to ballast water and insula discharge compliance requirements. Um, so it's a mouthful, it's a little bit complex. Um, so at our next meeting, we hope to have a discussion exactly what does that mean, uh, what are the steps that uh, we need to accomplish that report, and what I do anticipate is we most likely will have an ad hoc committee formed to focus on this issue. And what I hope is this will also be a great avenue for the feds, the non-feds to communicate with another and hopefully come up with some solutions to some of those concerns that uh, have come from the Western Regional Panel recommendations and also that Alan outlined yesterday. All right, switching over to uh, early detection and rapid response. 
Um, this has been a hot topic lately, and not surprisingly, this is our largest and most robust goal within our strategic plan. Um, so some of the high priority outputs that are coming out from those objectives, uh, the first one is to develop a framework for use of horizon scanning tools to determine U.S. hotspots to be targeted and monitored. Um, so this first is um, defining exactly what horizon scanning is um, and how it should be used, um, but also combining that with our species risk assessments to understand where the highest offenders are, looking at areas that are very vulnerable, looking at areas that are a priority that we want to protect, and really focusing on what are the hot spots, where are the areas that we really should have higher targeted monitoring. Um, the next one comes at no surprise, is to develop recommendations for minimal reporting standards for eDNA. Um, many groups are working on this, and we hope to uh, combine our efforts and not replicate anything or reinvent the wheel, um, but also very important that we don't have numerous standards out there. We're at a point where we're now standardizing the standards. Um, so part of this task really will be to scope and see what's already available uh, to see that we can then form into a formal recommendation from the task force. Um, the next one we have here is develop guidance and threshold and decision-making criteria to determine appropriate management actions to new species detections. Um, so what this comes about is that um, obviously we get a lot of new species occurrences. Wes is constantly setting out uh, new uh, alerts. Um, and so it really does come, what ones are the ones that we should be worried about? Um, which ones are the real problematic ones where rapid response needs to be initiated? Uh, so doing some work is trying to find where that threshold of that sweet spot is. And the last one this committee hopes to uh, work on this year is develop a report describing where emergency response funds are currently in use and provide a model to establish and administer this fund. Um, this is something that has been on the wish list, I think, for many of our members for quite some time to establish the emergency response fund. Um, so it really is looking at to how that would work, who would get the funding, how do you qualify the funding. We have a limited amount, where should it go to? Um, so kind of working through some of those barriers and developing a model for that fund. All right, switching over to control and restoration. Uh, one thing I think I failed to mention in my introduction to the task force is we do help the development of state management plans, but we also do have committees who come together to develop species-specific control and management plans. Uh, currently, the task force has approved 10 of these plans. Uh, QZEP would be one great example. Um, we also do have an Asian carp plan, one for mitten cramps, one for hydrilla as well. Um, we also have one for brown tree snake, um, although not an aquatic. It was kind of combined into our legislation just as a weird thing, I'm not quite sure why it's there, but it's there. Um, but also, many of these plans are quite dated. Some of them can be 15, 20 years old. Uh, so one of the issues of this um, committee is going to tackle is doing a deeper dive into those plans, see which ones are still relevant, see which ones should be revised, um, and also which ones should be retired. Um, also recognizing they may identify uh, some plans that need to be developed, uh, working very closely with the prevention committee um, as they start to develop their high priority species list. Um, but if we do decide a new plan is needed for some of those high priority species, developing that guidance for how to develop and how to implement that plan. A couple of more uh, high priority outputs here are to uh, survey members and panels for gaps in control and registration, or, I'm sorry, restoration, um, recognizing that there are some situations you may encounter where there's just simply no control measures that are available for you. Um, so trying to communicate to the, our research uh, community that this is an area that we really would like some further work on. And last but not least on the goal, we have to identify federal and non-federal entities that have the ability to develop and test new control restoration members. Um, so again, this just ties into the previous one where we want to identify where those gaps are, but we also want to identify those folks who can possibly assist and help advance that area. All right, moving right along to the research goal. Um, so this one is a very simple but very elegant as far as what they hope to accomplish. Um, really, the idea behind our research goal is that we want the task force to be more of a driver for what research is uh, promoted and executed throughout uh, the United States. Uh, so with them, we have uh, developed an annual research priority list. So this would be serving both our members within the task force as well as the regional panels, and then coming up with a system to make sure that we are refining and promoting the most high priority research that seems to be needed um, across the nation. 
Um, but not only do we need to identify the research it needs, we need to try to identify some parties that actually can conduct that research. Uh, so scoping our membership to see which ones have the expertise, which ones have the resources uh, to help out. Um, communicating that list of priorities to those folks, uh, but also realizing that we need research needs, we need people who can do the research, but we're also gonna need to find some potential funding for that research. Uh, so the plan right now is for this committee to do really a scoping to see what funds may potentially be available um, and then develop into the a model that we could potentially use to administer a grant research program. All right, last but not least, we have the education and outreach goal. Uh, so some of the high priority identified by this committee, um, the first one is to conduct an assessment of national campaigns and our guidelines that have been introduced by the task force uh, to evaluate their progress and also their effectiveness in changing behavior. Um, so as you may know, the task force has uh, developed two national campaigns. Um, the first one is our Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers campaign. Um, the second one is the Habitatitude campaign. Uh, so hopefully you're aware that both these uh, campaigns have received a refresh uh, in recent years with new websites. Uh, but now we're really looking at to how well are they working? Are we actually uh, reaching the people we wanna reach? Are people actually changing their behaviors um, as a result of being familiar with these campaigns? What should our target audience be? Who are we missing? What tools are most effective? Where should we place them? Um, so we are currently working with a uh, notice of funding opportunity that we hope to get out early next year um, that will contract a marketing firm that kind of specialize in this type of area. We hope to uh, get the information back and put that into a communications framework that will form the future of those campaigns and others. Um, the next one I'll talk about in the next slide, but that is to uh, finish the Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers portal. Um, I mentioned that site did get a complete revision last year. Um, so now we're continuing developing additional features for that site. Um, we also wanna define and identify leaders for a community of practice, um, recognizing that there are several people out here who do e either do outreach or just very interested in. So trying to create that forum where people can talk to each other, share ideas, share their evaluation, um, really learn from one another. Uh, so this committee is starting to put the wheels in motion for who should be involved and what that forum would potentially look like. Um, and last but not least, uh, this goal really focuses on the general public, but it also does have an objective that focuses on internal outreach as well. Uh, recognizing that we also need to educate our leadership, we also need to educate Congress on the issue. Uh, so one of the high priority outputs for them to do that uh, is to develop templates for our members and panelists to use that are consistent, uh, so that we're all being, providing the same key messages to our leadership and hopefully promoting the task force and our work. So very quickly on goal, I just want to jump back to our Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers website portal. Um, so talking to our members, talking to our partners at this campaign, uh, came very clear there was a need to develop a forum where people could upload their campaign materials and share with one another. Um, so we're viewing some of the information that was out there. We pretty much decided that we need three different features to this uh, feature that's gonna be built into the website. Um, so the first one is a uh, graphics library. Um, so if you go to the website, you're gonna see our brand standard up there, but what we're doing is we're now building um, those brand resources so that people can take the logo or take certain materials and they can customize it, they can add region-specific messaging, they can add specific logos. Um, so it's an easy way for you to get the Stop Aquatch Hackers and incorporate into your existing uh, outreach materials. Um, we're also gonna have a marketing showroom. Um, we do get a lot of great pictures from our partners as far as how the brand's being used, how your event displays look, if you're putting on a bobber, if you're putting on a hat. Um, so this really is gonna be kind of an ideas library where people can see how it's being used and get ideas for their own campaigns. Um, and last but not least, images. Um, this is something I personally struggle with all the time is trying to find really good, high quality images. And I think everyone in the room probably has had the same struggle at one time or another. Uh, so we do hope to find a library of images that people can go, they'll all be in the public domain that you can download and again incorporate to your outreach materials. So that is coming soon, um, hopefully by the end of the calendar year. Um, so please be on the lookout for it.
All right, and I am just gonna wrap up here with kind of a preview of our next meeting. Um, we are scheduled to meet at the next task force on November 6th and 7th. Uh, we're gonna be hosted by the USDA up in Beltsville, Maryland. Not quite as exciting as Alaska, but everyone, please, you are invited to attend. Um, all our meetings are open to the public. Um, so on the agenda, um, as I mentioned before, a very large part of our discussion is going to be the committees. Um, taking a look at their work plans, reviewing them, finalizing them, and then finally giving those committees the face-to-face -face time to start implementing some of their highest priority work. Um, ballast water again, this is going to be on the agenda. We do have updates from both the Coast Guard as well as the EPA on their uh, developments with developing those new standards um, and also discussing, you know, where the task force role will be in that work as well. Um, we will have an update from the National eDNA Working Group. Um, they're actually having their third workshop the week after our meeting, um, but we do hope to get an update on their last two meetings as well as where they're holding next and again looking for those opportunities for where the task force can assist. Um, we're also going to have an update from the uh, Genetic Biocontrol Workshop. If you're not familiar with this, this workshop was held this summer up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I did discuss some of those uh, techniques that we heard about in our keynote address as far as CRISPR. Um, and we recognize that there are a lot of concerns and uncertainties with these new technologies. So we're hoping to get an update from this group and try to determine where and if the task force should play a role um, as this new technology emerges. I um, mentioned before, we also have our update from Elizabeth Brown on the Q's app and the work that you have been doing through this panel. Um, we also have the, the USGS Non-Indigenous Aquatic Database update. Uh, so Pam Fuller, um, now Wesley Daniels, has become a standing item on our agenda. Um, it's always, I wouldn't say exciting, but informational um, to hear the new species that have been introduced into the United States and which ones could be potentially problematic, but also learning about some of the great work of the new tools that they have uh, been producing as well. And last but not least on the agenda, um, we do have updates from our other interagency invasive species organizations. Uh, we do recognize that the task force is not the only interagency organization in the federal government working on these issues. Uh, we do have the National Invasive Species Council. Uh, we also have the Department of Interior Task Team for Invasive Species. We have FICMEN U that works on aquatic weeds. We have ITAP that works on animal and plant pathogens. So this is an opportunity to learn more about these groups, walk through their own management plans and work plans and try to identify where those uh, commonalities are and try to kind of roll that up so they're all stronger together and working towards the same goal. Uh, so that is about all I have for you. I see Dennis getting up to kick me off the stage, so I'll wrap this up quickly. Uh, but once again, you can uh, find more information about our meetings on our website. We do try to keep that up to date with the agenda and all the travel logistics. Um, also, I'll have my contact information on the final slide here, uh, but I also encourage everyone to subscribe to our newsletter. I do send out a new weekly newsletter that I hope at least everyone has seen at one time or another. Scroll all the way down to the bottom, you'll see a subscribe button, um, but you can also contact me anytime and just request to be added to the list. Be happy to do it. So thank you, everyone. Um, again, this is my contact information. Feel free to reach out with any questions, concerns you have. <laughs>